Good morning. This is Pastor Dennis Roser. Welcome to Divine Service at St. John's Lutheran Church. The members of St. John's are committed to sharing the good news of Christ Jesus, who was crucified in the place of sinners, so that everyone who believes and trusts in him will not perish, but receive as a free gift everlasting life. St. John's is located at 1000 Bluff Street in Beloit. Our telephone number is 608-362-8595. Please visit our website at www.stjohnsbeloit.com. We are a member congregation of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Our Sunday morning worship service is held every week at 9 o'clock a.m. And we invite you to join us and receive the gifts that God delights in giving you through His Son. Today's program is given to the glory of God by Ron Castle in loving memory of his wife, Stephanie. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept the record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking His grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in His mercy, has given His Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come that by your protection we may be rescued from the threatening perils of our sins and saved by your mighty deliverance. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our gospel lesson is taken from the gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 19, verses 28 through 40. And when Jesus had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem, when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany, at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it, and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? You shall say this, The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road, as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives. The whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. 
peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Together we confess our faith with the whole Church of Christ through the Church's Confession, the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
In the name of Jesus, amen. Perhaps as I was reading the gospel lesson from Luke 19 this morning, you began to wonder if I had turned too many pages in the book. Did it sound a little strange to you this morning to hear the Palm Sunday lesson read as we begin the season of Advent? Did you find yourself thinking, well, that's not very Christmassy. That's, that's Easter. That's what that is. But the decision of those who put together our lectionary to read this lesson today is not without purpose. Advent, the season of Advent, is all about preparing the way for the king, as you saw in our hymn of the day this day. This passage, read most commonly on Palm Sunday, teaches us who that king is, teaches us the very nature of the king whom we prepare to receive as a babe in the manger. We read in Luke 19 that Jesus is making his way to Jerusalem, which they have been on this road since chapter 9, verse 51, passing through towns and villages, teaching and healing as he makes his way to the holy city. Now they have drawn near. At chapter 19, verse 28, we read that as he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany, at the mount that is called Olivet, he saw two, I'm sorry, he sent two of his disciples saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever yet sat. So basically, between Bethany and Jerusalem, you have the Mount of Olives. And somewhere between Bethany and the Mount of Olives, you have Bethphage. We don't actually know for sure where this city was located, this town. But they're making their way towards Jerusalem. And as he goes up into Bethphage, somewhere in the mountain area, he sends two of his disciples to go back into the town. And they will find, upon entering the town, a donkey. The colt of a donkey, a donkey that has never been ridden, and they are to untie it and bring it back to him. Now, if you're the disciples, does this sound like a great idea to you? Do you wonder about the appropriateness of this? For example, if you and I were walking along Route 43 and we were just at the ramp that ramps off into Clinton. And I say to you, hey, do me a favor. Just go down in here to Clinton, and, and you're going to find a Buick parked in front of Subway. Take it and bring it here. Might you have some qualms about this? Huh? I am sure they're wondering if this is it. If this is when they are going to find themselves charged with grand theft donkey for taking this donkey. Jesus anticipates their fears. He says to them, If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, The Lord has need of it. All right, maybe that doesn't put your fears at rest. One of the things that's interesting is that the word we translate Lord could actually also be translated owner. We wouldn't translate it that way in this context because Jesus is so much more than the owner of a donkey. But to be Lord is to be the owner of everything. And so in a very real sense, Robert Gundry, a New Testament professor, says that you could say, just say to him, the owner has need of it. The owner of this donkey needs it, and he has sent for it. Again, a reminder that because he is Lord, everything is his. Everything we are, everything we have, belongs to Jesus. It is simply placed into our hands, including ourselves, for his usage. 
So he sends them in and they go. And of course, the owners said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus. And throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. Now perhaps you're saying to yourself, all right, this is a great scene. I like animals. This is nice. But why are we doing any of this? Remember, he's been walking all this way. Why suddenly does he need a donkey to go the rest of the way? Did he sprain his ankle? What is happening here is that they are vesting him as the king. He is presenting himself as the king of kings, the Lord of lords. First and foremost, in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, the people are told that they are to rejoice, O Jerusalem, daughters of Zion. For behold, your king is coming to you, humbly and mounted on the donkey, the foal of a donkey. He is assuming his role as the long-awaited king and Messiah. He is fulfilling Scripture's promises that they may recognize that Messiah now comes. And what's more, you will notice that Zechariah mentions nothing about being on a donkey that has never been ridden. But this is intentional too. If you know anything about animals, and I know very little about horses and donkeys, but I know one thing, that the first person to ride a horse or a donkey better be somebody who knows something about horses or donkeys, or very quickly the animal will remove you from his or her back. Typically, they speak of breaking the animal. I don't really like that term, but they train the animal to allow someone to be on their back. This animal has not had such training. And so we see, again, the God who created all things and all things being under his command as Jesus mounts the donkey without a problem. And they lay their garments upon this animal, again as a display of Jesus' majesty, a display of honor and reverence. I mean, think about it. Do you really want your clothes to smell like donkey? Because that's what happens when you lay them across a donkey and someone rides on them for many miles. It's about sacrifice, reverence before a king. And even people are putting their cloaks down in the road that the donkey can step on. I mean, how great of a person would it take before you would be willing to lay your coat down in the road for cars to drive across? I mean, that would take a whole lot to get you to sacrifice your garment in this way. The comparison's a little off. I get it. If you lay your coat down in Bluff Street, I guarantee you that you probably won't be using the coat again. I get they could wash this cloak and use it again after the donkey trod upon it, but still, it's all about setting the scene because God knows that we are visual. We are visual people, even as we are auditory and multisensory. We need to see things. And so Jesus is setting the scene that here comes the king. And of course, the multitude, the multitude of people begin to cry out as well, proclaiming, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They are announcing that here comes the long-awaited Messiah. Have no doubts in your heart. Well, the Pharisees, the religious who's who of their day, they do have doubts about this. They do not believe that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. And so consequently, they charge all these people with committing blasphemy. How dare you say that this man comes in the name of the Lord? How dare you insinuate that he is the long-awaited Messiah, the king who has come to claim and redeem his people? And so they say to Jesus, because it's pointless to turn to the crowd and do anything. What are they going to do? Say to a screaming crowd, 
please, please, be quiet. Don't say this. They'll get run over. And so they say to Jesus, Rabbi, reminding him, he's a teacher in Israel of his responsibility. Rabbi, rebuke your followers. Chastise them. Make them stop. And to their surprise and to our delight, he says to them, truly I say to you, if they were to be keep silence, if they were to be quiet, the very rocks on the road would scream out because the king had come. But you know how that week unfolded. You know that the king who arrives in Jerusalem in his majesty and pomp would be stripped of his garments later that week, hit and spit upon, abused and tortured, and finally nailed to a cross. And to give up his spirit, to lay down his life, and to die. This is the reason we have this lesson this week as we begin Advent. Before we rehearse in our minds any of the Advent narratives, before we think at all about the spirit of Christmas and our preparations for Christmas, and I know it's hard not to do that when they put up the trees on the 4th of July in the stores, but before you get in that mindset, think clearly about the king we welcome at Christmas. He is not an earthly king that wants everybody to serve him. The king is seen most vividly at the cross. Luther himself once said that I know of no God other than the dead man Jesus hanging upon the cross. When you look at the crucifix, there is your king. There is the one whom we await his coming. Because he didn't remain in death. By the power of the Holy Spirit and the glory of the Father, on the third day he was raised to live again and never shall he die. There is kingdom victory. That is what a true king looks like. A king that cannot be conquered. It is to that king and that kingdom we make preparations. That we await expectantly his coming. That we prepare to sing his carols and to share in his joy. Because your king isn't a king who dominates you. Your king is a king who serves you. Upon that cross, all of your sins, everything that you carry with you, that terrorizes your conscience, the burdens you bear, even those nagging thoughts in the back of your heart, They were put on him. He was made to be a liar and put to death for it because we lie. He was made to be an idolater and put to death for it because we chase after so many other things and make gods of them. He was made to be an adulterer because we are guilty of sexual immorality and he was put to death for it. He was made to be a thief and put to death for it because we take things that are not ours. We get things in ill-gotten ways. Our celebration of the king is of a king who by God's grace has removed our sins from us. The multitude, the multitude sing in their song that we saw in Luke 19 about peace in heaven. There's a connection here. Maybe you heard it when I read it this morning. You remember the angels 
It's called, the crowd here is called a multitude, and here they sing about peace in heaven. In Luke chapter 2, verse 14, when we read the narrative for Christmas Eve, we read that after the angel spoke to the shepherds, behold, there was a multitude of the heavenly host, the whole angel army. And what were they singing? Peace on earth and goodwill toward men and women whom God chooses. This Jesus brings reconciliation between earth and heaven, between God and men and women. We are reconciled to our God through this king. This king has done everything that we may enter and belong to his kingdom. As you consider Christmas, as you long for what it will reveal, the magic that it will hold, that the suffering king who died in your place, whose blood has washed away all your sins, give you the peace and joy to enter into that kingdom gladly, to find your place there, because it is only in that that there is only any magic in Christmas, that there is any sense of having the Christmas spirit. In the name of Jesus, amen. Please join me in praying the prayer taught by the Savior. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you for listening today, and may the gifts of God in Christ Jesus be granted to you by His gracious will. Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless you, now and forever.